Starhopper scrubbed again, FAA situation assessment, Starship the road to KSC, super heavy construction begins and Rocket Lab launch summary. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. As always, there have been loads of things going on in the space industry, so let's dive right in. Starhopper FAA approval still pending. What can I say? The FAA keeps SpaceX and us fans waiting for the 200 meter hop test. As it seems, they are still not satisfied with the hazard analysis done by SpaceX. But what about it? What could those reasons be and why is the FAA reluctant to give the go for the 200 meter hop test? SpaceX needs a launch license for the 200 meter hop as the first FAA approval did not cover this height. The biggest problem here is the so-called environmental assessment. This includes possible danger to wildlife, human settlements and historical sites. Historical sites can certainly be ruled out for Boca Chica, though danger to wildlife and especially human settlements can't, as there are people living close by. As you can see, the first inhabited Boca Chica village house is about 2.46 kilometers away from the launch site. Also, the SpaceX facility is surrounded by the Boca Chica State Park and the Brazos Island State Park. There is wildlife all over the place. Now before you start arguing about whether a few birds pose a problem, they do. NASA and all other launch providers at KSC, for example, have to live with the same rules as well. There's all sorts of wildlife around Cape Canaveral in Florida and strict rules have to be obeyed to get cleared for launch. These are probably the two big question marks surrounding the holdup right now. The question then is if SpaceX's assessment of the situation satisfies the FAA. What could possibly keep the FAA from clearing the flight test? Could the hopper reach Boca Chica village? SpaceX has already demonstrated that it is able to control the hopper. Possibly the redundancy in the hardware is not to the FAA's satisfaction. Sadly, there is very little information on what is keeping the FAA from giving the go for launch other than a few tweets by Elon Musk and a few regulatory informations found in the FAA library. Library. If there's anyone watching the video who knows more about FAA regulations for experimental unmanned rockets, please comment on the situation. I am a pilot but have had very little to do with the FAA, let alone experimental rocket flight permits. Starship, the path to Kennedy Space Center. In last Thursday's episode, I mentioned a road construction that's currently going on in Cocoa, Florida and there has been new information surfacing this week. The path for Starship to Pad 39A is being cleared. So, as we learned in episode 25, the mystery on how SpaceX will get their Starship Orbital Prototype Mark II out of their Starship campus is being solved right now. They will be building a road down to the FedEx ground and from there Starship Mark II's first journey will lead onto Grissom Parkway. As you can see in this beautiful drone footage by John Winkop, SpaceX is well underway clearing the forest towards the FedEx ground. Paving the road won't take long, so we can expect the intersection to be done very soon. SpaceX is also already working on upgrading the power lines all along Grissom Parkway. Then Starship will continue onto Highway 528. Once on the bridge crossing the Banana River, SpaceX will most likely load the Starship prototype onto a barge ship and continue on the water through the Canaveral Lock into the west turning basin of Port Canaveral as specified in their environmental assessment released three weeks ago. That is a very neat solution to a problem people scratch their head about for a while now. Good to know that SpaceX had a plan in their pocket. Super heavy construction started in Cocoa, Florida. People are wondering how Elon Musk will get his orbital prototypes into space by the end of the year. Yes, Starship will be single stage to orbit, but it won't have any re-entry capabilities this way. So we need something with a little more oomph. Super heavy. And another video by Mr. Winkop. We cannot thank you enough for these views. It's greatly appreciated. A link to his channel is in the description by the way. As you can see in the latest aerial view of the Coco site, SpaceX has laid out 12 new ring segments. These can't possibly be for the upper or lower section of the orbital prototype. This is super heavy taking shape. Now the only thing we'll have to see is how quick SpaceX can build the booster. They will need plenty Raptor engines for it and all the tech will have to work flawlessly to make a flight including separation and return to launch site happen. So we can be pretty sure that Super Heavy will be built in the recently erected building. It would make sense to build it in a dry place and not let anyone see how they do it. In the end Super Heavy will be the secret sauce to Starship's success. 
There's some very exciting stuff happening in Florida right now. SpaceX keeps impressing with an astonishing pace and Super Heavy is coming to life. Rocket Lab's Look Ma No Hands Flight Summary Rocket Lab finally did their launch out of LZ-1 located on the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. It was their 8th launch to date and it was a rideshare. And this is not uncommon in the small sat business. The Electron rocket built by Rocket Lab is a small launch vehicle. Nonetheless, it is very impressive. It is built almost completely out of carbon fiber composite, giving it one of the coolest looks out of all rockets available today. It has electric turbo pump fed 3D printed Rutherford engines, which is very unique. It is a specialist for a special market, the ever-growing small satellite business. The launch took place on Monday, August 19th, after being scrubbed due to high winds on August 16th. On board the Electron rocket were four payloads, a satellite for unseen labs, as well as more rideshare payloads for Spaceflight, a company specialized in organizing rideshare missions, consisting of a spacecraft for Black Sky and the United States Air Force Space Command. The CubeSat that formed the cornerstone of a new maritime surveillance constellation for French company Unseen Labs that aims to deliver precise, reliable and secure maritime data enabling organizations to monitor their own vessels and observe those that present risks such as pirates and illegal vessels. Mission management and rideshare aggregator Spaceflight contributed three satellites on its second mission with Rocket Lab. Among the rideshare payloads was Black Sky's Global 4 Earth Imaging satellite. The satellite joined Black Sky Global 3, which was launched to low Earth orbit on an Electron rocket in June. Black Sky's constellation delivers rapid revisit satellite imagery to assist with monitoring economic activities such as crop development and herd migration, or surveying damage following natural disasters like wildfires, floods and earthquakes. The other two were experimental satellites for the United States Air Force Space Command designed to test new technologies including propulsion, power, communications and drag capabilities for potential applications on future spacecraft. Now there's one more special thing about the Electron rocket. It has a first stage, a second stage and an optional kick stage, which was used on this launch. It is designed to circularize payload orbits before separation. This enables Rocket Lab to deliver extremely precise orbits to their customers. Once the kick stage has fulfilled its purpose, it can reignite its engine once more to deorbit. That's right, Electron leaves no debris in orbit. All components are deorbited after use, leaving a clean orbit behind. By the way, it is a joy to summarize Rocket Lab launches, as they are doing a great job of presenting it. About the same level as SpaceX. The Electron launch vehicle had a clean liftoff from LZ-1 and ascended nicely, followed by a tracking shot through the atmosphere and into the clouds. Max-Q was passed through just fine and the rocket continued onwards to space. At T plus 2 minutes and 34 seconds, the rocket had a good main engine cutoff and stage separation. By the way, for those wondering, as I always get lots of comments about it, the booster does crash into the ocean. Though Rocket Lab right now is working on a way to recover their boosters with helicopters. I'm going to do a separate news about that on a future episode. But for you to know in advance, this is Rocket Lab's eighth launch. They have been carrying flight recorders on the boosters on two previous launches and on this one. So they are already recording data on the booster's re-entry. On flight 10, they will launch the first booster with re-entry equipment and then plan to catch the booster in flight before they hit the ocean. Very cool way if it works and good for Rocket Lab, as it will reduce launch costs and on the small satellite market, even more important, speed up launch frequency. Then followed the fairing separation, again without any trouble and something you don't find on the timeline, the battery hot swap. Remember how I told you that the rocket has electric fuel pumps? The Electron rocket drops one of the batteries needed for this after it is empty. So they do a hot swap while the engine is running from the empty battery to a full one and then separate the empty one. This is a very neat trick to get even more payload capacity out of the launch vehicle. At T plus 8 minutes and 50 seconds, the second stage engine cut off and the rocket entered a good transfer orbit. Shortly after, the kick stage got separated and all satellites had good orbit insertions. As there is no camera on the kick stage that will provide a stream, there is no footage of the separations, but still this concluded a very successful launch for Rocket Lab. An incredible small launch provider from New Zealand with great ideas. Go Rocket Lab!
So this wraps up today's episode of What About It. When will the FAA finally have enough information to give Starhopper its final flight? And how long will it take SpaceX to build Super Heavy for Starship? As always, tell me in the comments. Here we are at the end of the episode, thanking all those patrons for their help and more are joining the club. I invest all the money back into the show and I post pictures of my purchases and an ever-growing studio at a regular basis to my patrons. If you want to join this list, feel free to click on the link in the description and be part of the team, including Discord access and a chance to ask me all your questions in person. Thank you for watching this episode of What About It. If you liked what you saw, please don't forget to subscribe and like as this helps me the most. Feel free to hit me up on my Patreon page so I can get additional help in doing more and better content. As this gives me more time to focus on what I really love doing, to give you the latest and greatest about space and science. I hope to see you on the next episode. Until then, have a great time. Good to know SpaceX had a pocket in their plan. <laughs> Assessment of the situation. Pass the penny. I am a pilot, but have bad, but have bad experience with the FAA. <laughs> no. There is no kick stage on the footage. There is no live stream on the rocket lab.